Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Mike Counter. Our special guest is Dr. Mark Glanz, Associate Professor of Communication and Media Studies at St. Norbert College. One of Dr. Glanz's area of studies is social media, and that will be the focus of this show. Mark, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Glad to have yeah. you on. Well, I, I touched on your background just a little bit, but why don't you go ahead and tell us how you landed at St. Norbert College? Sure. I, uh, I graduated from the University of Missouri with my uh, PhD in communication, specifically political communication. Uh, and then uh, my first job after that was at Coker College in Hartsville, South Carolina. I spent a couple years there. Uh, I really enjoyed my time there. It was a little bit more human than what I was accustomed to when I was growing up in upstate New York. So I started to look for uh, jobs that would be a little bit more north. The upper Midwest seemed okay. like a good landing spot. And St. Norbert College had an opening that year. So it's worked out pretty well. All right, communication and media studies. Yeah. Why, why that area? Well, you know, when I went to, to college as an undergraduate at SUNY Oneonta in central New York, I didn't know what I wanted to study. Um, and one of the reasons, I assume, is because I never had a communication course before. So in the schedule that they made for me, I had an 8 a.m. Monday public speaking course. And 8 a.m. wasn't easy for me, but I learned that to a certain extent, public speaking was. I really enjoyed that course. And I started to realize that I think I like what this guy up there is doing, this uh, professor thing. I'd never seen anybody do it before. I'd never met a professor before. Okay. And so it was at that point that I kind of got the idea that maybe I'd like to go into higher education. And you know, that was the subject matter that I really cared about. So I stuck with it. So growing up, Mm -hmm. did, you, did you watch a lot of television news? Did you, did you follow communications pretty closely growing up? Or just, was it that professor that spurred you on? Yeah, there are a lot of things I realize now um, that I very much cared about the media. Um, I didn't know that it could be something you actually studied. But it's fascinating to me how even before I took that, that career path, it was a big part of my life. For instance, when I was really young, um, I used to measure time in episodes of ALF. Do you remember the show ALF? Mm -hmm. So I didn't know at the time that it was a 30 minute sitcom or anything, but if we were on a long car trip and I was starting to get anxious in the back seat and get a little bit um, you know, <laughs> uncomfortable back there, I'd ask how many more ALFs until we're there? How many more <laughs> ALFs until we're at grandpa's house? And they would tell me, oh, it's about two and a half more ALFs. So I, you know, whatever, my four-year-old mind could put together. I would kind of run through an episode at ALF in my mind. And so on some level, I was probably always paying a little bit more attention to media than maybe the average kid was, but had no idea it could be a career or an area of study until much later. And of course, today, media is more than just television mm -hmm. and newspaper, and we'll get into that. There's social media, which is very hot right now. Uh, not m many people know this, but your nickname is Coach. Yeah. How do your students call you Coach? They do. Were yeah. you an athlete? Uh, what, how, was, how did that come up with no, Coach? No, I was, I was not an athlete. In fact, uh, the other, just this past semester, somebody saw me wearing socks, and uh, they said, uh, they were looking at my feet, they said, oh, those are almost athletic socks. And I said, yeah, well, I'm almost athletic, so that's why I'm wearing these. But I've never really coached anything, and I wasn't much of an athlete. Um, there was this moment when I was teaching at the University of Missouri, it was an introductory public speaking class, if I recall. Uh, we were about two or three weeks in, and I was about 30 minutes into that particular lecture. And a student, who I still remember was on the left side of the classroom, over by the, the air conditioning heater unit, raised her hand as I was just given this mind-blowing lecture about <laughs> public speaking, and she said, um, like, what are we supposed to call you? And she was real sassy about it, and it, I knew that she hadn't been to class until that day, <laughs> and I knew that she was not listening to my amazing lecture. And so I said to her, well, you know, on the first day, I think I told everybody to call me Mark, but you seem pretty special. I think you should call me, and in that moment, I just came up with the word coach. You know, and the rest of the class laughed because they didn't seem to like her very much either. And she had some sense of humor about it too. And they learned that I had never actually coached anything that made it more fun for them. I taught back-to-back -back classes. When the second class found out that the first class had a special nickname for me, they had to call me that as well. And then before you know it, I was introducing myself around Columbia, Missouri as the coach. 
having never coached anything. So, so it stuck and traveled with you. Yeah, and I tell that some version of that story uh, on the first day of class every year, and students seem to, to like it, or at least they oblige, yeah. Well, Coach, tell <laughs> yeah. us some of the classes you teach at St. Norbert. Sure. Explain some of those courses. Yeah, I teach an introductory course called Principles in Mass Communication. Um, that's kind of just an introduction to here are the you know, basic forms of media that we see in the United States. Here's how they work. Here's who they profit. Here are the, you know, the structures behind them and some of the most basic effects they have on individuals and society. Uh, I also teach a capstone course in television criticism where we focus on pretty close readings of television texts and try and analyze them for you know, the messages that might not always be on the surface. We try and dig a little bit further to find out the implications for gender and race and sure. all of that. Uh, I teach a political communication course. I teach a crisis comm course. And the one that's most relevant to social media is communication technology and social change. Okay. Social media, mm -hmm. let's talk about that. That's the focus of the show. It's a game changer. How has social media changed the world we live in today? Uh, one of the things, the most obvious things I suspect is that things seem to happen so much faster as far as the news cycle goes and as far as what's relevant and for how long those things are relevant. So it creates a lot of demand on the side of the people that produce information and news. They have to get more information, they have to find interesting things, and they have to put it out right away. And it also can create a little bit of a burden for people who choose to follow uh, the news via social media. Uh, it can be maybe not stressful, but it could be quite the task to try and pay attention to exactly what's going on and make sure you're fully informed and you have all the relevant context about any given uh, current event or news situation. Now, I worked in the news media back in the day, but we never had cell phones and we didn't have social media, and it certainly changed that industry. Yeah. Now, when a station has what would be called uh, an exclusive story, they don't hold it anymore because of social media. It can get out there and it's you know, they get it out on their websites, they get it out on social media as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. That consuming information, it comes from everywhere for people. I mean, there's so much out there, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of costs and benefits to the whole social media landscape right now. Uh, for the people producing news, they want to make sure that they get the story out there as soon as possible. Um, the good news is we get the news right away. The bad news is you risk some inaccuracy that mm -hmm. way if you're reporting too fast and you put a premium on getting it out there. And it's often uh, devoid of all the necessary and relevant context. You know, we got the information out there, but what does it really mean? Sure. So that can be missing too. There are other benefits to social media, uh, though, from the perspective of the uh, consumers, which is that it does have sort of a unique self-correcting quality. It's absolutely true that people find themselves in information bubbles and they get, you know, if they follow the people that tend to reinforce their own already existing opinions. But it's also true that if something inaccurate pops up on social media, you have all kinds of other people on social media who are ready to pounce on it and say, actually, no, you don't have that quite right. It's a little bit more like this they tend to, those mistakes tend to get ironed out rather quickly, even if they're initially reported inaccurately. What do you say to those critics who don't believe social media is a good thing? For these reasons, one, uh, bullying can be done on social media. Um, kids spend too much time on Facebook, Snapchat mm -hmm. in particular. Um, it takes away from family time because kids today always have their heads down in a phone and they don't even sure. know where they're driving to. What do you say to those people that don't believe in social media and, and are critics of it? Yeah, there are a couple ways to address that. The first would be just about every new technology, especially communication technologies, are really just going to amplify the forces that are already there within a society. So if we're a society that's obsessed with entertainment, it's no surprise that we're gonna use our new technologies and our social media for entertainment purposes. Um, you know, if, we're, if we were a society more focused on education, we'd probably put more of these technologies to use in educational settings. So that's one of them. You know, it's usually not the technology that made us bully, right? That mm -hmm. was an impulse, that was a, a thing that was already there that was just perhaps amplified or changed by social media. Uh, and on a more individual basis, mm -hmm. when we talk about you know kids and if they're looking at social media too much or whatever, uh, it can be important to remember that not all of those activities are bad, that 
actually children can derive a lot of meaning from those activities. They can learn things from video games. Um, even people who spend a ton of time on their computer may be part of meaningful, worthwhile communities online that are actually supportive in really important ways uh, socially. So before we criticize somebody for spending too much time in front of their phone or computer, it's worth asking, you know, actually, how are they using that to make meaning out of the world and out of their lives? And it's probably benefiting them at least as much as it's harming them. Let's just backtrack a little bit. I didn't get into your research. Could you talk a little yeah. bit about some of your research? Sure. So uh, I tend to be kind of eclectic in the things that I've chosen to research. Um, I do some political comm stuff, which is great because then we take a look at how politicians um, and other political institutions are using social media to get their messages out there. Um, I do some uh, critical analysis of political communication as well as uh, television texts, uh, sitcoms and dramas and such. And, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff I do on social media and new media. Um, I've published in the Journal of uh, Radio and Audio Media about uh, digital streaming services like Spotify and Pandora and how they're both similar to and different from traditional terrestrial radio. Um, I've done a little bit of work with memes, specifically uh, some co-authors and I, we analyzed how memes can be used um, to counter the messages from large uh, corporations like oil companies. When oil companies are trying to tell you about what they think they're doing to the environment, here's how memes by everyday users can counter that narrative. So yeah, it's quite, uh, sometimes I have trouble focusing on any one given thing for very long. So I jump around a lot, but I have fun with it. Is it safe to say too, I mean, everyone can be a journalist today, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can blog, you can put things on Facebook, um, and people are sharing all this information, whether it's accurate or not. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the society we live in today? Just sure. Uh, the name for what you're describing there is usually citizen journalism. And it's the idea that anybody who has a phone in their pocket can record something, um, can then distribute that information to a very large audience. Two things that weren't possible before, right? Both sure. elements uh, were not things that previously existed. So we have, again, costs and benefits to that whole situation. On one hand, now we have more eyes and more reporters, so to speak, in more places. We are also less reliant on large mainstream media to tell us what is important and to tell us what we should care about because the things that a everyday citizen points their camera at might not be the things that a professional news organization thinks to point their camera at. So um, we get an agenda that is maybe a more authentic um, expression of what's really interesting to everyday people and citizens. And so that part is great too. On the other hand, we get a lot of people that, don't, that aren't trained to produce and distribute the news, which means maybe they aren't doing it correctly. Maybe they're doing it inaccurately. There's some danger that they'll do it unethically. I mean, journalism schools exist for a reason. So we kind of have you know, two sides to that coin now. One of the most interesting things that social media has done is turn people who are normally just consumers and turn them into producers. They don't just uh, take information from you know, the media producers, they actually send it out there as well. And there are a lot of interesting things happening with the quality of video. Obviously, technology's uh, getting better and better and we have videos that are really high quality, things that could have only been professionally produced at one time. And then, of course, the internet and pockets of the internet have uh, their own aesthetic where sometimes it's not quality as far as production value that is actually privileged or seen as worthwhile. Sometimes it's okay and more interesting to have grainy video or bouncy video or, you know, that's just not the aesthetic they've chosen because they pride themselves on not being slick mainstream uh, presenters of information. They want it real. Yeah, that's, and that's their currency. It's, it's authenticity rather than professionalism or production value. Sure. Let's talk about businesses and social media. There are businesses all over the world and many of them are on social media, but yeah. there are those that are still reluctant because they don't have a plan or a strategy on how to deal with social media. Maybe they don't have the resources. What advice would you give to those businesses that are not yet on social media going forward? I think, uh, you know, there is reason to be reluctant. You know, you don't want to just jump into things if you don't have a plan 
But you know, there's a good chance that if you're not really paying attention to what is being said about you on social media, it's going to be said about you regardless. In other words, you should probably join that conversation. You should probably drive what's being said and how your uh, brand or your image is interpreted throughout those spaces. Just because you don't have an account and you aren't posting regularly doesn't mean that your name's not out there and other people aren't talking about you. You might as well try and influence that conversation in a way that helps you, right? But first they have to understand the platform, sure. right? I mean. And sometimes with technology ever changing, ever new, um, they can't keep up with that. How, what advice would you give to a business that maybe wants to get on Facebook and just learn that platform first before they develop a strategy and then tactics and then move forward? I would encourage them to you know, jump in. They could use their personal pages to experiment before they actually come up with a professional page and put their face out there. If they feel like they may stumble a couple times first, then you know, there's ways to take baby steps into it. And you know, I feel like I'm gonna tell this as a joke, but there's some, uh, a hint of truth to this too. You could always hire a, a communication and media studies graduate from St. Norbert <laughs> College. We're talking about this stuff all the time and they'd be happy to come on board and help you out with that. For it's sure. it's interesting. Kids today, I mean, they grow they've grown up with this technology, so it's just second nature to yeah. them. But many people from my era, it's all new and it's always changing, and trying to keep up with it can be intimidating. Yeah, um, they, one of the things I like to do on the first day of communication technology and social change is to ask them to give me stories about their parents or their grandparents and how those folks are misusing social media in some way. And the <laughs> stories are, are pretty funny. It's also interesting, you know, the younger generation today, they were on Facebook, but now their parents are on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for the next, they're always trying to yeah. stay one step ahead and yep. look for the next thing, right? Yeah, they've got Snapchat and Instagram for all of those things. Uh, and corporations, uh, people in branding and marketing are also always looking for the next thing. So they're always looking for spaces that, you know, young people think are cool enough to spend a whole bunch of time on and then they try and get their brand out there too so that they can interact with uh, you know, their potential consumer base. Now you do a lot of research too on image, right? Yeah, image and image repair. And what's that all about? Explain that a little sure. bit. Sure. Um, it's kind of the reactive side to public relations research. Um, obviously, you can be proactive. You want to get your organization's story out there and covered in the news. The reactive side is sometimes a news story pops up that doesn't portray you in a very favorable light. In that situation, what are you going to do or what are you going to say when it really hits the fan, right? So what we take a look at are the types of messages individuals and organizations can create when they face a threat to their public image. Um, obviously, some of the most simple techniques are just denying that any wrongdoing occurred. Um, another very simple technique is mortification, which is just accepting blame and admitting wrongdoing. And then, of course, there's all kinds of excuses and accounts that, that happen in between those. Okay. Now, there's been a lot of businesses that have had crises yeah. and lived through it. Do you think there are businesses that have had crises, lied about it, and still survived? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, I do. I think there are, are companies that have managed to lie about things and still survived. Um, and if we're talking specifically about companies, they're in a unique situation. One thing they're able to do is fire somebody. Mm -hmm. So something just happened with your company, you don't look very good, you get to point the finger at somebody a little bit farther down the chain, say that was the problem, that person no longer works for us. Whether or not that was true, we won't really know, but right. they've solved the problem. They are also, to some extent, incentivized to avoid mortification and avoid admitting wrongdoing. Because on one hand, we have this problem of what is their public image. On the other hand, they could be liable for all kinds of things in a court of law. So they're actually incentivized to kind of skirt around the truth. Maybe the easiest and best thing for their public image is to say, yeah, we're sorry we did that. We take full responsibility. Uh, we're looking to move on. We're looking to fix the situation with some corrective action as best we can. But to do that would be to admit guilt and possibly make them liable and possibly you know, open themselves up to lawsuits. So it's a pretty unique situation for some of those corporations. But I do think they they get away with some untruths and half-truths and, and some of that. I saw a couple of statistics I just want to throw at you. 48% of Americans have interacted with companies or institutions on in at least one social media network. 
Also, 41% of Americans say it's important that the institutions they engage with have a strong social media presence. Sure. Those are pretty impressive numbers. I mean, absolutely. That's how powerful social media is today. At its best, too, one of the most important things that the internet and social media can do is give a little bit more power and control back to the consumer. So by being able to you know, talk to these corporations and brands online, it's one way of holding them more responsible and accountable for the things that they do. And from the perspective of the organization, they're getting feedback constantly about whether or not people like what they're actually doing. Sure. So it works in both ways. Yeah, in both directions it can be beneficial. Now when you talk to classes about social media, what's that presentation like? What do you focus on? Sure, um, there's so much to talk about, right? So on one hand I want to talk about what organizations can do to use social media to help expand their business or their nonprofit organization. On another hand I want to talk to individuals about what they can do to make sure that they're using social media in a way that benefits them and not those corporations, right? Like you gotta understand if you're carrying around a cell phone that that means that corporations have access to your location and you know they're in your cookies when you do a Google search and they have a ton of information about you, right? So there's all this surveillance out there. How can you protect yourself from that or at the very least know that it's happening and know that it's a trade-off whenever you use these things? Um, on another hand, I try and talk about how technologically determined our society has become on certain levels where anytime we're faced with a problem, the first question we ask is like, what tool, what, what technology can we use to fix this situation? That's true of the problems that we have like on a really large governmental level as well as um, smaller individual situations. So there's just a ton of stuff to talk about and then we get into the way these companies make money and advertise to people, what Facebook is doing and what Twitter's doing. So it's actually a tall task to try and fit everything into one semester's worth of classes. I just find it interesting too with Donald Trump, uh, the president, sure. how he uses Twitter mm -hmm. to get his message out more than the mainstream media now. That's, that's a change. Yeah, uh, so one benefit to politicians is that they're able to get their message directly to voters and citizens without the filter of the media. Understandably, that's going to benefit politicians. Their message goes out exactly how they want it. At the same time, there is probably still a role for traditional media in understanding, interpreting, and reporting the messages that our politicians give us. And I brought that up because you have a new book out, uh, Persuasive Attacks on Donald Trump in the 2016 Presidential Primary, right. written by you and co-authored by William L. Benoit. Yes. Why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about this book? Sure. Uh, we were taking a look at the primary and paying attention just like everybody else is and we started to realize that it seemed as though there were an awful lot of attacks in this particular primary season. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why you wouldn't expect there to be too many persuasive attacks in the primary phase of our campaigns. Uh, for instance, people are members of the same party, right? So why would they attack each other? They don't have that many policy differences. It doesn't benefit them to attack each other on character. You know, somebody stands up on a debate stage and says, I have four beautiful children. How is the person next to them going to say, no, you don't, right? right. I mean, so you don't expect to see too many attacks, sure. but sure enough, in the last uh, presidential election, there were quite a few. So we decided to actually measure just how many there were, where they were coming from. Donald Trump was at the center of many of them. Um, Donald Trump was usually attacked either the first or second most in any given medium that we analyzed. That includes debates televised advertisements, Twitter, Facebook, and a, and a host of others, late night comedy. And before you feel bad for uh, Donald Trump being attacked so frequently, it's worth noting that when he wasn't the first target of attack, um, he was the first, he was the one who did the most attacking. In other words, he was usually involved somehow in hmm. these things. Interesting. Yeah. Now is there a social media component to the book too? Absolutely, yeah. So we looked at uh, Twitter and Facebook and there are a, cool, uh, a number of cool and interesting things that happened um, in the last election cycle related to social media. Um, we looked at what every political candidate said and sometimes those messages were really unique because they're inexpensive uh, and because they don't have to be incredibly well thought out. They were sometimes more inventive and a little bit more humorous. We saw a lot of politicians rely on allusion to popular culture 
in order to make fun of Donald Trump. So I think Ted Cruz called him Ducking Donald and had a picture of Donald Duck when uh, mm -hmm. Donald Trump said he wasn't going to debate anymore. Um, Rand Paul uh, did a poll on Twitter that asked uh, who his supporters liked more, Donald Trump or Nickelback, and uh, obviously Nickelback being wildly unpopular. So they made a lot of interesting plays on social media that you're not going to see in political ads or maybe on a debate stage. Uh, also, we saw the Never Trump movement, uh, which was hashtag mm -hmm. Never Trump. That was based almost entirely on social media. And one of the really interesting things were, was taking a step back and looking at user-generated memes. These are things that aren't necessarily produced by really influential institutions or by any campaigns as we know them, but that you know everyday users are putting out there. And those tended to be uh, pretty unique and compelling too. There was a, a hashtag Trump your cat campaign where people were encouraged to brush their cats, collect the fur, put the fur on top of the cat's head so that it looked like Donald Trump's hair kind of flying sure. away and looking silly. And, and so, yeah, everyday internet users got pretty creative with things too online. Some people say if you're out there and you're being talked about good or bad, it's a, it's a good thing, even if it's negative. Sure. Would you agree with that? There's something to be said for uh, brand recognition that, you know, as long as they're talking about you, your name is popping up in places. But I believe there is such a thing as bad press. Uh, in other words, there are just certain things and ideas, behaviors that you do not want to have your, uh, your organization or your individual image tied to. So there's a certain bit of truth to that, but it has its limits. What would you say to folks that say, there's just too much out there, there's so much news, there's so much information. Twitter really mm -hmm. generates a lot of uh, news content and people go to Twitter for news content. What do you say to those folks? I mean, that where do I go? Where do I start? I mean, there's sure. just so much out there. Yeah, I think it's important to get a healthy balance. Um, in other words, on Twitter, make sure you're following multiple um, perspectives from multiple different accounts and every once in a while even if you don't have too much faith in the you know institutional media that has been so important in the United States for so long even if you've lost faith in that go, go check it out every once in a while because sometimes the narrative you're getting on Twitter is very different than what they're talking about um, in the New York Times or the Washington Post and maybe that's because Twitter has it right or maybe that's because you know Washington Post is ignoring something important, but you should probably make sure you you get both perspectives, uh, and then when necessary, take a step back and ask yourself: Is this really making your life better? Right. Sure. The most important reason we need this information is so that we can make decisions about voting and about some of the consumer decisions we make. So if you find yourself in a place where you're just consuming this news as entertainment or it's making you angry or, or whatever and it just doesn't feel like it's healthy for you anymore, maybe you should stay in the game because, hey, this is making you a more informed citizen and that's really important when you're trying to decide how to vote and what decisions to make as a consumer. What's next for you research-wise? Anything in the sure. hopper? Uh, I've been teaching a lot of the, uh, the capstone in television studies. So I just by talking to my students, I have a couple ideas for television programs I want to analyze. And the most interesting ones usually intersect with new and social media in some way. In other words, television is remarkable because it's been around so long. And even in the face of all this new technology, it's having you know as much success as it ever has as far as the popularity of shows and the quality of those programs. And social media is part of it, right? Anybody who watches the show Scandal knows that part of the appeal is being on Twitter at the same time and saying what you think about what's happening on any given episode of Scandal and learning what other people are saying. So it's all connected in really unique ways. I'd like to see how those new media and old media intersect. Well, you're certainly in a popular area right now, so I think you're going to be busy for years to come. I think so. Mark, I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. Enjoyed Thanks it a lot. very much. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our show. Until next time, I'm Mike Counter. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College.